Good morning, everybody. Well, what a wonderful, wonderful day it is, except for all the other people. Have you noticed that life would be great, except for the people? Oh, it's people. It's people who are the problem. Not all of them. Some of you are awesome. In fact, every single one of you are awesome. But other people, people who are not watching this live stream, oh yeah, they're a problem. You're probably saying, Scott, why is your microphone not on for the year? I don't know. No real reason. But that might be better. Now, if you'd like to take this up a notch, and I think you do, all you need is a cup or a mug or a glass, a tank or a chalice or a cup. What is it? A canteen jug or a flask. you think I'd memorize this by now. Nope. A vessel of any kind. Fill it with your favorite liquid. I like coffee. And join me now. For the unparalleled pleasure, the dopamine the other day, the thing that makes everything better. It's a simultaneous sip. Happens now. Go. Oh. Oh. So good. Well, I'm going to start with the shittiest news so that everything else doesn't seem so bad. Are you with me? You probably all heard that... Uh, Norm MacDonald passed away yesterday, age 61. I have several thoughts on this. Number one, I don't like it when people younger than me, uh, when people younger than me die. Uh, well, it looks like we have people complaining about the microphone over there on, oh, it isn't working, interesting. How about that? Can you hear me now? All right, so I just unplugged the microphone. So I think we would be on the iPad's microphone over on YouTube. All right, but there's nothing I can do about it. Sorry. So uh, my my roadcaster uh, apparently just died. That's my mixer. So my mixer is just sitting there with all, all, the, all the settings just sitting there like nothing's happening. I tell you. <laughs> I tell you. Anyway, back to Norm MacDonald. So <clears throat> I had a strange interaction with Norm MacDonald, and I, I think a lot of people, uh, now the microphone's unplugged because the, the mixer died. Let's see, I'll show you. Do, do, do. All right, I'm just about gonna lose it. <laughs> I'm really close to taking this mixer and smashing it to pieces on my floor right now. I'm like, I'm like this close. I don't know if I can resist it. Oh. Because I'm just trying to pick it up and show it to you. And, you know, it's all curled up. It's like not working. You see the levels not even moving or anything. So, I'm trying to resist. Oh. Oh, I've got a sledgehammer in my garage and I want to take you down to the garage and destroy this thing in front of you really badly. Really badly. <laughs> oh God, do I want to break this thing. Oh. There's only one person in the world who knows exactly how I feel right now. <laughs> you know who you are. <clears throat> you know who you are. I'm gonna shake that off. I'm gonna shake it off. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> I don't know what it is with with audio in me. But anyway, back to my topic. Uh, Norm Macdonald passed away, and uh, a lot of people will tell you their little story about meeting Norm, and I've got mine. So one day, Norm Macdonald contacted me, and I ended up talking to him on the phone, and it was this was mm, maybe three or four years ago. And he called me just to ask me for some life advice, which is the weirdest thing in the world because I'm a gigantic fan. I had no contact with him whatsoever. But he had some, some issues and uh, he, I guess he was familiar with my work and thought I might have some, some suggestions. So we, we chatted a while. I don't know if I said anything that was useful. But I've got this other weird connection to him Two other weird connections. It's, it's just weird how many connections I have to, like, the, the headlines. 
What is it, uh, if you're familiar with uh, Akira the Don and the music he makes by taking podcasters' voices and manipulating them and adding music to them, uh, and so he did that with some of mine, and one of them that did well was where I read a Norm MacDonald quote about, uh, you know, good versus good, yes. And it really, really worked out well as a, a lyric for a song. It's just a Norm MacDonald tweet. I just happened to read it, and it got turned into uh, music. So that's out there. But the weirdest part about this is that in the past month, I had chosen two people as my role models. One for my hobby of learning to drum. I'm trying to become a drummer. And the other for comedy. And, and I think I mentioned both of them in public. One of them was Charlie Watt, and the other was Norm MacDonald. And they both died this week. I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, it's not funny. It's not funny. But the two people I chose as my role models for my, my two you know, fields of, of interest, they both died this week. Now, on a personal note, when celebrities die, I generally, you know, it's not like I'm going to cry about it. There are people I don't know. But I've cried twice when celebrities died. Once was John Lennon, and so, um, sorry. All right, moving on. So uh, CNN uh, continues uh, continues to Sorry, I had a bad week. Anyway, uh, CNN. Um, CNN continues to brainwash you with uh, anecdotal stories of people having bad experiences with COVID. I like to read, you know, the, the, the one per day. So today's is, uh, let's see, um, the anecdotal persuasion is a woman who got vaccinated in Mississippi and she got COVID and died because she was immunocompromised. Sorry. So, all right, I'll be fine. Um, so apparently one in 500 Americans have died of COVID. Does that sound, does that sound like a lot? One in 500? Why are no thumbnails working? I don't know. So one in 500 people died of COVID in the United States, I guess. And that doesn't sound like a lot. But here's the question. How many seniors and obese people died? How many seniors and obese people died? It's not one in 500, right? Is it one in 50, maybe? One in 50? Because if one in 50 of that crowd died and you were in that crowd, that'd be pretty scary. One in 500, not too scary. One in 50? Well, you have my attention. At one in 50, I'm going to pay attention. Um, and I'm wondering, what, where would that rank on, uh, in terms of uh, causes of death? If it's one in 500 for people in general, where would that be? Like how many people die in cars? It's more than one in 500, right? How many people die riding, I don't know, how many people die swimming? 
probably less than one in 500. So I don't know where that stacks, stacks up. Um, <laughs> uh, there was a tweet by uh, Laughing Jesus. That's his name, don't blame me. So Laughing Jesus tweets, he says, I stopped reading Dilbert because of Scott's support for uh, support of the Trump, <laughs> of the Trump. Uh, I may revisit that decision. Dilbert is pretty effing funny at times. And so I thought I would like to encourage more of my critics to, uh, to take this approach. So if you're a critic of mine and you have a problem with me for whatever problem, I think you should punish yourself because that'll, that'll show me. So if there's anything else you would like to deny yourself that you enjoy, uh, I think that would be a pretty good protest. It worked for Gandhi, all right? Gandhi enjoyed eating, but he decided to not eat as part of his protest. There's a good history for this. And I think that my critics should uh, learn from Gandhi. I mean, really. Can you think of anybody who would be a more morally inspiring figure than Gandhi? I don't think so. And Gandhi did a hunger strikes to try to get freedom from uh, Great Britain. And I think that my critics should take a, take a note. If you're mad about anything that I've ever said, consider a hunger strike. And if the hunger strike doesn't feel enough, have you ever tried hitting yourself with a blunt object? Um, I mean, I haven't, but then again, I don't really need to punish myself. But if you'd like to punish yourself as part of a principled, morally and ethically proper demonstration, I recommend something painful for all of my critics, because that'll really show me. So you should either try to run 25 miles without training, uh, don't eat for a week, don't sleep. Sleeping would just make me happy. Because you know what makes me happy? I love it when you get enough sleep. So don't do that if you want to protest me. So in fact, I would like you to be really healthy. I would like all of you to eat right, get sleep, and don't drink too much. But if you want to protest me, there are lots of things you can do to yourself to really, really make it hurt. Drink too much, overeat, don't sleep. And if you do those things, I promise you, I'm going to feel it. It's going to it's gonna be bad for me if you hurt yourself. So I sure hope you don't do that. Well, uh, the more I think about it, the more I think that leaving the Taliban to China is a stroke of genius. Uh, reportedly, a major brawl broke out last week inside Kabul's presidential palace. And at least one leader of the government is missing, possibly dead. <laughs> and... Uh, the Taliban taking over is a little bit like, you know, what happens if the dog chasing your car actually catches it? Like, like what's he going to do when he catches it? So I don't feel like the Taliban won. I feel like the Taliban <clears throat> has some issues. Maybe some internal fighting. Maybe the Taliban are not all on the same side. Maybe the only thing that unified the Taliban was fighting against the existing government. I've got a feeling things aren't going to go so well for the Taliban. And, I mean, it's tragedy for the Afghan people, of course, but the Taliban themselves, I, I don't think that's going to be a good day for them. And I don't think they're going to love it when China gets their hooks in them. Because China doesn't really want to just work with the Taliban, do they? <laughs> Does China just want to have a little commerce with the Taliban? Nope. No, China wants to own the Taliban. Taliban the China wants to dominate the, the Taliban. I'm sure that will go over well. Don't see any problems ahead for them. Seems like that should work out pretty, pretty well. So good luck, China. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I hope you enjoy your Taliban. Um, let's talk about the California recall. Newsom won, it looks like, easily. Uh, Larry Elder has conceded. Um, it looked like it was close there for a while, didn't it? Do you remember the polls that said it was close? Well, we were qu quickly informed that those polls were not accurate. Let me tell you the polls that were accurate, the ones that showed that Newsom was going to win by a mile, and then he did. But, you know, 
Uh, but you know uh, that. Well, so why did uh, why did uh, Gavin Newsom win? Uh, is it because the vote was uh, R I G G E D, which I'm not claiming. I'm just asking. Is it because it was always going to be that way, and the polls were wrong? Why is it we can't have a time when the polls are right and the vote is right? Can we have that? Here's a case where we think the election was maybe right, but the polls were wrong, but then they were right. How's your uh, credibility? <laughs> I don't know if you could have a lower credibility for an election than everything that happened in California. Maybe 2020 was lower credibility. But I have no reason to believe there was any massive fraud. Do you? Has anybody seen anything that would indicate massive fraud? Now, here's the good news. If Gavin Newsom were to win, oh my God, Richard, thank you. You didn't need to do that. Um, here's the good news. If Gavin Newsom were to win, and apparently he has, the only way I wanted him to win was big. Because if it were close, uh, yuck. If it's close, it's all going to be about the election itself and, you know, the integrity of the election and was there fraud and where's my mail-in ballot and all that stuff. But luckily, and I say luckily because it's a weird kind of luck, if you can call it that, it was so not close that maybe it wouldn't matter even if there was some fraud. Now, we have not detected any that has been confirmed. But we're probably better off, probably better off that it was a big win. At least, at least there's one less thing to worry about. Now, the question about why, why did he win? Well, um, I think Joel Pollack had some of the most insightful comments about this. Um, part of it might be that uh, kids went to school. You know, if you're a parent in California, the thing you cared about most was kids going back to school. And then everything else, you know, was a bother and something you complained about. School's a big deal and he got that done, right? So, you know, other states got it done too, but at least it was one thing. Uh, imagine, imagine this recall with kids not in school. Can you imagine? I don't think the vote would have gone the same way. I think if Newsom hadn't gotten kids in school, it could have gone the other way. But the other thing is that uh, uh, Newsom did a good job of painting Larry Elder as just uh, black Trump. <laughs> if, you're, if your opponent can turn you into black Trump, he did a good job. And it looks like he did a good job there on the persuasion. So, but I think the bigger story is there are twice as many Democrats. And that's it. There are twice as many Democrats. That's the end of the story. You know, you can look for the little things that tweak this or that, but, you know, there's twice as many Democrats, so that's pretty much the whole thing. So there's this uh, right-wing conspiracy, or is it, that uh, there's somebody in charge of turning off uh, Biden's microphone in certain situations. And I guess Senator Risch, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, was asking about this, and Tony Blinken was just laughing at him, saying, mm, no, there's nobody in charge of that. And apparently it doesn't pass the fact check that there's anybody who, who even could be in charge of it because the examples of it are just normal, the normal way things work. There's no actual example of this happening. But let me ask you this. Um, the first time you heard this, that the, uh, the idea that there's somebody who has control of turning off Biden's microphone, and Rich was asking, who's that person? Because that would indicate who's really in charge. Who is the person in charge of Biden's microphone? The first time you heard that, what was your impression? Because I'll tell you what it should have been. It should have been a little bit too much on the nose, right? A little too perfect that the person who is really in charge of the country is literally the same person in charge of the microphone. That is way too on the nose, right? It'd be one thing to say, oh, I think there are powers in the wings, you know, it's Susan Rice, it's Obama, whatever. That's actually kind of reasonable because we do know that ex-presidents could be influential and, you know, the deep state. There's enough to suggest that people could have power without being in power. That's not crazy. 
but with the same people or one person get control of the microphone no <laughs> i mean anything's possible but a little too much on the nose so look for that too much on the nose thing it's so predictable all right uh tonight tonight um i will be a guest on gutfeld exclamation mark gutfeld exclamation mark on the fox news check your local times we're talking about the the evening one i guess it's different time zones different places you can all find it anyway i'll be doing that remotely uh tonight and that is the answer to the question on locals that they asked me before i came here on youtube and the answer is uh no i will not be stoned today because <laughs> uh, i'll be on live tv later have i ever been stoned on live tv okay yes but you didn't know it all right um i think i solved uh, covid in case anybody wants to know so there's an article i just tweeted around which questions how we've handled covid uh and it questions whether social distance is the thing we should have concentrated on versus the time that we spend together and the argument is this if if your uh, virus is spread on spittle like water droplets then distance makes a big difference because those droplets will come out and hit the ground so if you're far enough away those droplets don't get there but if you have an aerosol virus like coronavirus where it just sort of floats in the air for a while. It's not like the droplets are hitting the ground right away. The idea is that the time you spend in the room could be the thing that matters, not so much the distance. Because you could be right next to somebody and you know, your plume is going up through your mask and their plume is going up, but it's sort of diluting and filling the room. So wherever you are, if it's in the aerosol, it's just hanging in the air. So what matters is the time you spend in the room and the ventilation, uh, not the so much the distance. Does that make sense? It's a reasonable hypothesis, right? That we managed the managed it wrong because we didn't understand the importance of the uh, of the, the hanging in the air part. But here's my question, which I add to this, which I believe will now completely solve the pandemic. Are you ready? Are you ready? Solution to the pandemic. Right now. Drum roll, please. Fans. Turn on your fans. Here's my reasoning. And uh, I would like to um, get a fact check on this. I asked on Twitter if anybody studied this, and I didn't see a response before I got on. But the hypothesis goes like this. And by the way, this is just ignorant specula speculation. This next thing is just for fun. I'm not a doctor, not a virologist not a fluid movement expert but i'm going to give you some uh, common sense and let's let's just think it through it goes like this the the odds of you getting covid i believe are determined by the viral load so it's not just that you were exposed to it so fact check me on every part of this right fact check me on my assumptions and then my conclusion so assumption the amount that you're exposed to makes a big difference. Second assumption, and this has no scientific basis that I'm aware of, I feel as if a small amount, small enough, might give you some protection from the COVID without giving you COVID. Now that's purely speculation. And it's based on the fact that your, your body might say, hey, I feel like there's something out there that didn't quite infect me. I, I, I detected it, but maybe I should just get ready for it. Now, I don't know if your body can do that. Pure speculation, not based on any knowledge or research or anything else. But if we know, the only thing we need to know for this following thought is that the amount of load matters. Now, it matters two ways. One, it matters whether you get it at all, right? And the other way it matters is how badly you're sick. So two ways it could matter a lot. Now, the how badly you're sick part, we know that's real, right? So I don't have to speculate that the amount of initial load you get could determine how sick you get. So let's say that's the only thing we know for sure is how sick you'll get. 
but we're not for sure whether a little bit of exposure might actually help you in some weird way. So that part, forget about that for now. Just, just that reducing the load could be good. Now turn on the fans. Here's my question. Did the aerosol virus tend to move in clouds? So this is the big question to fact check. Anybody who's got, you know, fluid expertise, do me a fact check on this. So let's say you're in a room and you've got just normal ventilation. The windows are not open, all right? So windows closed, normal ventilation through the AC. Not enough to stop anything, apparently. But now let's say you turn on fans. If you have fans on and there's, and there's movement, do you get the same viral load or does the fan distribute it faster such that there's uh, more virus, let's say below uh, your waist and more virus maybe above your head and not as much in a cloud that's sort of surrounding the people who are putting it off? What do you think? Now, how hard would it be to test it? I think you could test it somehow. So here's my, here's my uh, question. Turn on the fans in every room, make sure you've got airflow or open a window if you've got that option and see if the people who had put on fans and open windows everywhere they went uh, or even carry like a little port portable fan. You know those little portable fans you carry? Would you be better off having a portable fan that you just held here and blew people's you know, uh, particles away? than having a mask? <laughs> Maybe, right? If you had just a little fan that you walked around with when you talk to people and just, just distribute the air. Um, <laughs> uh, and here's a question on locals, a perfectly good question. What about a blowjob? Now, I'm no doctor, but uh, I feel that that's a perfectly good question because um, as far as I know, there's not a single case of anybody getting COVID while giving a blowjob. So if you're worried about the COVID, ladies and gay men, if you're worried about getting the COVID, nobody has ever contracted COVID while giving a blowjob. Now, I don't know that to be true, but I'd like it to be true. So just think about that. There's an interesting story in the New York Post by Melanie Notkin about why progressive women want to date men who act like conservatives. So apparently even progressive women like men who act like men and uh, do things like hold doors and pay for dinner and walk on the curb side of the sidewalk to protect them from puddles and God knows what from the street. And uh, also to make the plans, to make the plans. And uh, what do you think about that? How many of the women, the few women who are <laughs> brave enough to watch this? By the way, if you're a woman and you're watching uh, this, you're special because uh, I don't think most women can, can hang with this. For some reason. I mean, my audience is 90% plus men. Um, all right, now... Let me ask you this, men, I've heard that what women like more than, I, and I've heard this so many times, right? Tell me men if you've heard this also, that women, no matter whether they're left-leaning or right-leaning, leaning, that all women like it when men take the initiative to make a plan. Say, oh, we're going here and, you know, put on your nice clothes and we'll be going there. Women, can you confirm? that you like it when men make the plans. And does it, and do you like it because it, it makes, it seems like the man is uh, being alpha or being assertive or being sort of a man. Is that what it feels like? All right, well, you're all wrong. Although your opinions can't be wrong, of course, so your opinion is right. But let me tell you what you're missing. Let me tell you as a man, how I feel if I'm part of a couple and the expectation is that I'm supposed to make the plans, how does that make me feel? Ladies, how does that make me feel? Women, anybody? Tell me how it makes me feel as the man when I'm the one who has to make the plans. 
Does it make me feel like an alpha male, strong, in control? Nope. It makes me feel like your fucking secretary. So let me say this again because your husbands can't tell you this. Husbands, just shut up for a minute. Guys, guys, don't say a thing. I got this. All right? I got this for you. Disagree with me privately. When you're talking to your spouse in a minute, and you're going to, don't say you agree with me. You don't need to. I'm gonna, I got this for you. Okay? Don't get into this. You will get divorced if you get into this. Just agree with your wife. Let me do the hard lifting here, okay? If you expect your man to make all the plans, you're treating him like your secretary. And it doesn't fucking work. Here's how it goes. Hey, wife, I just made some plans for us at 8 o'clock. Ooh, ah, I wish I told you I had plans to go out with my girlfriends tonight. Okay, well, okay, I, I tried, but at least you know I made some plans. Tomorrow, put on your good dress. We've got dinner reservations, 7 o'clock. Ooh, ah, not tonight. Tonight I've got a little bit of a headache. I wish you'd asked me earlier. All right, well, okay. We'll, we'll take this, we'll take a run at it again. How about the weekend? Weekend comes, I got some plans. We, we're going to take a trip. Ooh, there? Yeah, I, uh, I just went there. I went there with my ex. That's like sort of the last place I want to go. Okay, well, we'll try it again tomorrow. I'm going to make you a new plan. Watch me be all alpha. I'm a man. I'm a man and I'm going to take charge. Take charge of this situation. All right, so I got new plans. We're gonna go, uh, gonna go watch the uh, uh, monster trucks, monster truck rally. So that'll be at six o'clock on set. What? Oh, you don't like the monster truck rallies? No, you don't like those. Okay. Well, I already bought tickets, but I'll throw them away. We'll try it again tomorrow. So, men. Just don't say anything. Ladies, I know what you're thinking, that you like your man to be take charge and make plans. Shows he loves you. You're treating him like a secretary and you're making it impossible for him to even fucking do anything. Don't ask him to do something that isn't a thing. He can't make plans for you. Do you know what does work? Here, let, let me tell you what works. Wife, hey husband, I made plans tonight. Six o'clock for dinner. Husband says, oh, that's great. Uh, I told Bob we were going to get together. I'll call and cancel. And then you go out to dinner. It's different. <laughs> it's pretty different, right? Um, how about uh, walking on the curb side of the sidewalk? How many of you men walk on the curb side of the sidewalk? because it protects your, your woman from whatever danger there is in the sidewalk. Okay. Now, when you walk on the curbside, and let's say you cross the, you cross the road, and then you, you know, let's say you're at an intersection or something, how often does the woman who you would like to not be on the curbside, how often does she take the curbside, just because that's the way it works when you turn the corner, and then you have to move her away from the curbside? So, how many times does she do that if you're taking a walk? All the time, right? You're trying to walk on the curbside, and she keeps walking on the curbside. And you got to move her back. <laughs> it just doesn't work. So, <laughs> anyway. Uh, anyway, it's a great article by uh, uh, Melanie Notkin. I enjoyed it. Um, I think chivalry is maybe uh, not exactly what you think it is. I think that what women think is an alpha man is a man being your secretary and having no chance of succeeding, right? If one in 10 times the guy makes a plan and it works out, he's a hero, I suppose that's good. But it's a, it's a dumb fucking idea and it doesn't work and you should get over it. All right, um, let's talk about the TDS general. This is the biggest news. So General Milley, according to a new book by Woodward and somebody else, Costa, I guess, um, he was so afraid that Trump might spark a war with China 
that he called China to reassure them and make some plans on his own. Now, Trump says he doubts this really happened. And Trump has pretty good instincts, and Trump also knows how many stories were totally made up about things that happened you know, during his, his administration. So given that so many things are just made up, we don't know. Now, I don't think we've heard a confirmation or denial from Milley himself, so we'll wait on that to find out if this is true. But let's imagine it's true for a moment. Isn't it treason? And isn't this taking civilian control uh, away from the, the government and giving us military control? Because the reason that Milley gave is that he wasn't sure that Trump was mentally capable, mentally capable in his judgment, his personal judgment. Did I say his professional medical judgment? No, no. He's a military guy. Did I say that Milley... Uh, consulted with a uh, band of psychologists and psychiatrists, and they told him, hey, Trump is dangerous, you better do something. Nope, nope. It was General Milley himself who just decided that Trump was mentally uh, unfit and that he better uh, make his own foreign policy with China. Military policy. That's treason, isn't it? If, if you're making military plans with not an ally, not an ally, was Milley warning China of an attack? Yeah. <laughs> now, suppose the worst case scenario happened and we had actually attacked China. There's no chance of that China. By the way, China, if anybody's listening, there was never any chance we were gonna attack China. We don't wanna attack China. Can you think of anything dumber than attacking China? Do you know, I don't even think that Milley, the general, would have had to be the one to stop it. I think every soldier would have just stopped. Can you imagine being in the military and the order comes down to attack China? What do you do? Do you run and grab your gun you know, and, and go attack China? Or do you say to yourself, hold on. <laughs> now, let's say you're just a soldier, right? You're just a Marine and you hear that the, the order has come down for the United States to attack China, and you haven't even heard a reason. There's not even a reason. What do you do? <clears throat> well, I don't think you attack China. <clears throat> I think you literally say, um, slow your roll. Are you telling us China's not attacking us? There's no immediate danger from China, and you want us to attack China? I just don't think. I just don't think anybody would do it. I mean, you'd have to have at least a reason. <laughs> so I don't think Billy had any, you know, there was no real risk. So how bad is this guy's judgment? His judgment is awful. And this is the same guy who was, in, you know, a, the key player in Afghanistan withdrawal. This is the guy who, you know, said it was a mistake to walk with Trump with a, you know, with the Bible or whatever to the church. This guy has terrible judgment as far as we can tell. And on top of that, he looks stupid. Do you know who he reminds me of? Years ago, I was a supervisor at, of a group of people in the bank. And one of my employees, I asked him to put some data in a spreadsheet. And I walked by and I saw him with his calculator, his hand calculator. And I said, what are you calculating? He said, well, I'm, I'm adding up the, the row in the uh, spreadsheet so I can put in the total. And I said to him, well, you know, that's what the spreadsheet does. And let me show you how, because he never used one. So I said, you just put this you know, little equal sign here and, and do this. And he goes, oh, okay. Came back an hour later, he still had his calculator out, calculating. And he said, no, it's just faster. It's faster to do it on the calculator. He was a dumb guy. He was a dumb, dumb guy. And all I'm saying is that Millie looks like that guy to me. He looks like the same guy, like the guy who couldn't reason himself out of a paper bag. And um, he has to be fired. Biden has to fire this guy. Do you know why? Because General Milley has said, well, if the reports are true, I mean, first you'd have to get his confirmation that any of this happened. But if the reports are true, 
Biden has to fire him because it means that Biden doesn't have control of the military. This guy gets to decide if Biden is mentally sound and then to decide whether to do what he wants or make up his own decisions. Milley, if the report is true, and that's a big if, you know, even Trump thinks it's not true, but if it's true, he can't be, he can't work for Biden because Biden is obviously mentally challenged. Obviously, everybody can see it. And if being mentally unfit means you don't have to listen to his commands, then we've lost, milit we've lost civilian control of the military. Now, of course, there's a separate argument which says maybe we should <laughs> because it's Biden. I don't know if he's capable either, but I'd like to think there would be enough people, even civilians, that we wouldn't really have to worry about some problem. But, you know, because I think the civilians control Biden, so there are enough adults in the room. I'm not worried about him starting a war. But if this guy can just decide that the president isn't fit just on his own, we don't have civilian control. It's the most basic thing, well, one of the most basic things we need in this country is civilian control of the military. It's, it's like so fundamental to the whole system staying in place. Biden has to fire him immediately. And here's the catch, if it's true. Biden has to fire Milley for what Milley did to Trump. And I would have a whole new respect for Biden if he does because that's nonpartisan. It's also the right move. And he gets a twofer because Millie was part of the Afghanistan thing. All right. Um, would Millie take directions from China? He was talking to China. Suppose China said, look, here's the deal. What we need you to do is X, and then we'll do Y, and then between the two of us, you doing X and me doing Y, you know, we can overcome Biden or we can overcome Trump. To some extent, even indirectly, he would have been kind of in a position to take orders from China. If you know what I mean, sort of, you know, indirectly. That's not good. Um, and Tuff said, uh, Trump said, uh, uh, I've had so many calls today saying that's treason, number one. I'll bet that's true. And Trump continued acknowledging that he was tough on China regarding trade and COVID. And he went on to describe the idea that he would unilaterally attack China as, quote, totally ridiculous. That is totally ridiculous. Was there anything, even the slightest whiff, that Trump would attack China? Or to put it another way, is there anybody in the United States, man, woman, child, or you know, un, unidentified, who would have said, let's attack China? Can you find me one person in the whole United States, in politics, privately, you know, in the alley behind your house, anywhere? Is there any person who thinks we should attack China unprovoked? Remember, it's unprovoked. <laughs> Are you serious? And yet, Milley was dumb enough to think that Trump would be the one person in the whole world, the one person who would attack China unprovoked, at least militarily unprovoked. Now, if Trump had sent a, a team in to kill the fentanyl dealers, and maybe that sparked a war, I would say that was worth it because <laughs> the fentanyl is a military action. So we can, we can certainly respond to a military action with military action. So if Trump had militarily you know, gone into their country and killed their dealers, their fentanyl dealers, I, of course, would support that completely, even though that's a military action. But it's a military reaction to a military action. Um, Sounds like he was being brainwashed by the media. Yeah, that's exactly what it sounds like. It sounds like General Milley was brainwashed by the media and believed, believed CNN. I mean, in a way, CNN probably turned this guy. You silly Milley. <laughs> All right, yeah, Taiwan's got a real problem. Okay, so that's what I got for today, or is it?
Yes, it does. Yes, I do. I'd love to hear an answer on the the idea of using fans. You know, I, did you ever see that? Uh, there's an M Night Shyamalan movie with Mel Gibson. Somebody will tell me the name of the movie. <clears throat> Somebody tell me the name of the movie. But they're Signs. God, that was fast. <laughs> you are so fast. Yeah, the movie is Signs. And the, you know, I don't want to give away the movie. Yeah, I'm going to give away the movie. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. If you've not watched an old movie called Signs, I'm going to give away the plot. Spoiler. Uh, in the end, they find that there's some simple solution to beating the aliens. I'll just keep it that way. And I keep thinking that there's going to be some simple solution to beating COVID. Like, I just feel like it. But not really based on any smartness or research or anything. It just feels like there's something there. Uh, yeah, it could be mouthwash. It could be mouthwash and fans. Could be that. Mouthwash and fans. In fact, I'll bet you they will find out something like, you know, soda. <laughs> you know, if you drank a Diet Coke every half hour, you probably wouldn't get COVID because Diet Coke kills everything. Um, now, I'm not suggesting that. Yeah, it could be smoking, it could be neti pots, it could be dope. I, I feel like there's something out there that is just going to make a difference. Yeah, vitamin D we know about. All right, that's it for now. And I will talk to you all tomorrow. And I'll see what I can do about fixing my... You know what's weird? So this is weird. So today I had this problem with my uh, mixer, the, the roadcaster. Last night... I looked at it and I realized I'd been leaving the power on overnight so I didn't have to change anything in the morning. It would just always be ready to go. And I looked at it and I said, I feel like I should turn the power off sometimes because I wonder if just being on all the time could ever cause it to glitch. I literally thought that for the first time last night and I left it on anyway and it glitched. Is that a coincidence? I've never had that thought before. The one time I have that thought that leaving it on might be a problem it glitched. How many times have I used this thing? 100? 1 out of 100? What are the odds? All right. See you on Gutfeld! Exclamation mark tonight.